My name is Nick Johnson. I'm the lead developer for the Ethereum name service. And I'm here today to give you, thank you very much, uh, here today to give you an update on uh, what we've done in the last year uh, and what we're up to now. Um, so first, for the, for the few of you in the hall who, who may not already be intimately familiar with the Ethereum name service, what is it? Uh, the e ENS is a naming system that is, uh, solves what we call Zuko's triangle. It's a trilemma that says no naming service can be human meaningful, decentralized, and secure all at once. And for a long time, people believed that was probably true. The advent of consensus systems with blockchains has made that untrue. And uh, following a named coin's footsteps, uh, we've been able to launch ENS, which is, satisfies all three of those properties. And so ENS is the Ethereum name service. It's a naming service built on Ethereum, but that doesn't mean it's just for Ethereum. It's not for naming just Ethereum resources. You can use it to name IPFS content, Swarm content. Uh, you can use it to insert text records. Uh, you can use it to point to Onion sites, as I'll show you later. Um, so we really want it to be the, a new naming service for the internet that satisfies all three of those important properties. Uh, so today, I'm gonna talk about uh, what we've done in the last year, uh, how things have been going. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our migration process to the permanent registrar. Uh, I'm going to talk about the short name auction process, which is underway currently. Um, then about DNS namespace integration, which is how we're making it possible for you to use your DNS names uh, inside ENS. Uh, our IPFS and Onion integrations, and then a brief preview of the things we're working on now and what we're looking forward to launching in the next year. So first of all, uh, the last year at a glance. Uh, this is the number of names registered on ENS, how it's evolved uh, over the time since we've launched. Uh, the top line there in the blue is the total number of names in the system. Uh, the second line there in the red is the number of names with resolvers set, and the third line is the number of names that resolve to addresses. So as you can see, we've had steady growth uh, in the, the nearly three years since we've launched. Um, and let's drill down on that a little bit. Uh, October 2018, so this time last year, we had 224,000 names registered, and this year that's up to 310,000. But I think the other two figures are the more interesting ones. First of all, we've got the number of names with resolvers, and so this is the first step in setting up your name. You first buy the name, and then you set a resolver contract for it. And if you're buying the name just to speculate on it, uh, to, to sell it to somebody later for more, uh, there's no reason you'd set this up. So this is a reasonably good metric for actual adoption and use uh, for ENS in the wild. And so it's gone up from 28,000 uh, this time last year to 60,000 now. And it's not just an increase in absolute numbers, it's an increase in percentage uh, from 12.5% all the way up to about 20%. So we're really pleased with that and we want to keep monitoring this and we hope it'll continue to grow. Likewise, uh, names, uh, sorry, addresses aren't the only thing you can translate ENS names to, but they're probably the most popular application at the moment. So we can monitor similarly the number of names of addresses, and that's up from 8.5% a year ago to 12% today. So we're really encouraged to see that this growth in ENS isn't just more people speculating on names, more people to hoping to make a profit off reselling them, but it's more people actually using them for their intended purpose. Uh, so next up, I'm going to talk about uh, our migration process. Uh, so uh, in May, on May the 4th, we launched the new permanent registrar. That replaced the auction registrar, which required a, a lengthy auction process in order to register names uh, with the new instant registration. Um, so uh, when we launched that, there's a one-year migration period. During that period, anyone who owned a name on the old registrar can migrate it to the new one. And when they do that, they get their registration extended until May the 3rd, 2020 and they get a full refund of the deposit they put down to originally register the name. Uh, it, you also have the option to just release the name. You can do that, uh, and you get deposit back, but then the name becomes available for registration by others. Uh, so there's a one-year migration period. Uh, the new registrar supports instant registration with just two transactions, um, and in order to keep your name, you have to pay $5 a year per name uh, rent, and there's no limit on the renewal periods. So for instance, uh, somebody's registered walmart.eth and protocol ETH, and they've paid the registration all the way out to 2040, which means that that name is absolutely solidly locked into the system, at least until then. Uh, so we've had 10,000 new registrations since launch, uh, and the migration process is interesting to look at too. So on migration day, uh, ENS had 309,000 names registered in it, 
and there was 176,000 Ether locked in the deed contracts. So when you bid on the name on the interim register, you had to put a deposit down, and you get that deposit back when you release the name or you migrate it to the new registrar. So how are we doing today? Today, we're down to 241,000 that haven't been migrated or released. We had 4,000, about 1% were released, and 59,000, about 19% have been migrated. Uh, in terms of the ether, it's actually even less. Uh, there's 13% have been of the ether deposits have been returned, and 86% uh, are remaining. And you can sort of see the progress here, uh, with the exception of a, a blip around uh, the middle of the year. Uh, it's been reasonably steady, but it's actually tapering off a little bit. So if you have ENS names that you registered before May the 4th, 2019, there is free money sitting there waiting for you to claim it back. Uh, release your name or migrate it, which is the better option, to the new registrar. You'll get your registration extended and you'll get all of your deposit back. And uh, we can stop sitting on all of this ether that's doing nothing. Uh, so next up, the short name auctions. Uh, we have been uh, moving on with making shorter names, three to six characters available via OpenSea. Uh, and some of you, probably most of you, will be aware that we had a slight hiccup uh, a week or two ago um, where somebody managed to obtain a number of high-value names uh, without paying full price for them. Uh, so I'm going to go into a bit of detail on just how that happened. Um, what you're seeing here on the screen is an example of an OpenSea uh, order message. Uh, so OpenSea works by people placing bids by signing a message offline and sending it to the OpenSea API. And that message contains a number of important fields, such as uh, which exchange contract to use, uh, who the maker is, the person making the bid, who the taker is, that's our contract, uh, how much they're willing to pay, and so forth. Uh, it also contains the target address, the address that should be called if the bid's accepted, and the call data for it. Um, and we believed uh, that OpenSea's API was uh, validating all of this data. We also had a series of additional checks of our own against many of these fields. Unfortunately, we were mistaken and they were mistaken and neither of us was verifying the target data, uh, which is embarrassing. Um, the result was that somebody was able to place bids that were ostensibly against uh, one low value name that ended quite soon, but in actual fact would finalize another name. So by bidding on uh, foobar.eth, they were able to finalize defi.eth uh, before that auction should have ended. Um, so that resulted in them obtaining 17 names uh, and uh, for very small bids in each case. So what we did, uh, we obviously we stopped the contract. We uh, made an offer to them. We said, uh, if you want to return those names to us, we will re-auction them the way they were supposed to be auctioned. Uh, and we'll provide you with a bug bounty of 25% of the final sale price. And I'm pleased to say that they accepted the offer. They returned the 17 names to us, and those are now back on auction. So uh, if you are here, thank you very much. Uh, if you want a security consulting job, please talk to us. Uh, there was a second smaller issue with the auctions that we've also resolved while we were paused, and that was that some bidders uh, were given the wrong information in terms of uh, what fields to fill out in the bids. So if you were using the user interface via your web browser, this was absolutely fine. But if you were using the SDK integration, if you were sending bids yourself uh, with an automated solution, uh, you may have been submitting bids with the wrong target field. We identified the roughly 30 or so auctions that were affected by this, where the top bid was a bid that didn't have the right target field. Uh, and those auctions have been extended a little further to give those users an opportunity to place valid bids that replace them. And if you're affected by this, you will have received an email that gives a full description of, of how to do that. Um, so the short name auctions in general, uh, we're auctioning off all the three to six character length domains um, in partnership with OpenSea. Uh, we sort of looked at all the effort we put in for the original um, auction contracts, and we went, well, we're not an auction business. We're, uh, we're trying to do naming. We're trying to build a naming system. We don't want to put hundreds of our hours into building a system that somebody else has already built and or they already know how to operate it. So we partnered with them in order to do the name allocation. Uh, so most five to six character names, uh, all of these names are on auction now. The five to six character ones are ending between the 15th and the 22nd of October. Uh, four characters a week later, 22nd to 29th, and three char th character names, the shortest ones, ending between the 29th and the 5th of November. Um, if you're interested in getting a name that represents you, um, some of these are quite contentious, but many of them are going for the minimum of, of five bucks a year. Um, you know, the auction process exists in order to make sure names are fairly allocated 
Um, but that doesn't mean that necessarily your first name or your last name is going to be popular amongst a lot of other people. So if you want to get it, go there, have a look, uh, and maybe snag yourself a name that represents you. Um, so next up, I want to talk about the DNS namespace integration. So ENS is more than just .eth. Uh, .eth is the namespace that is native to Ethereum that we sort of completely control. We can enforce strong contractual guarantees on it, but it's not all there is. Uh, we believe that ENS exists as part of the global namespace, the same namespace that's inhabited by .com and .xyz and .tv and so forth. And so we're doing our best to integrate with that. And there's two ways we're doing that. One is a permissionless integration via DNSSEC, and the second is bespoke integrations with top-level domains that are working with us. So first of all, how does the DNSSEC integration work? It permits anyone who has a DNS domain, like mysite.com, to register the same domain on ENS. So that means that if you have mysite.com in DNS and it's your website, you can also have mysite.com in ENS and people can pay you by typing in mysite.com. They can load up your smart contract by typing in mysite.com into any wallet or any application that supports ENS. Uh, so to set this up, this is deployed right now on .xyz and uh, that's our sort of test domain. We're going to roll it out to way more top-level domains, like most of the 2300 top-level domains early next year. Uh, but right now, if you have a .xyz domain, you can go to app.ens.domains, which is our new URL for the manager. Uh, you can enter your domain name, and it will provide you with a series of instructions for setting it up. Uh, the second sort of integration we're pursuing is the, the individual bespoke ones. So these are top-level domain providers who have decided to work with us directly to make it easier for their users to integrate with ENS. And the first of these was uh, .lux. Uh, they launched a bit over a year ago. Uh, they have first-class support for ENS, which means that if you register a name with them using one of their supported registrars, you can go into the control panel, enter your ENS uh, series Ethereum address, hit go, and it's just done. It's you know several steps shorter than the DNSSEC integration. It's as simple as it could possibly could be. So if you're interested, get one of those, and you can instantly start using it anywhere that a uh, ENS name is accepted. Uh, the second integration, slightly different, we're working with .cred, the, the TLD, um, to support a DNS record integration. The idea is that we can host the DNS zone for .cred on the blockchain. And effectively, this turns every Ethereum node in the world into a secondary name server for cred. It means that if you have a .cred domain, it can't be taken out by, or the, the DNS service can't be taken out by denial of service. It can't be taken out by service failure because anyone in the world can replicate those records and serve them up and, and verify them for themselves. Finally, we're also working with .art. Uh, you might be familiar of the Arts Digital Twin. This is their project to have uh, physical artworks that have a corresponding uh, existence on the blockchain in the form of a non-fungible token. Uh, we recently um, enabled their namespace on ENS, so they'll now be able to offer domains via ENS. Next up, uh, we've been working with uh, the IPFS team. Uh, we got a generous grant from them, uh, and we've been working with them and Jim McDonald uh, to build integration, closer integration, between IPFS and ENS. The way this works is uh, you can point any ENS site on .eth or anywhere else at an uh, IPFS content, um, and if you use it right now in MetaMask, it will just resolve. But you don't have to be running MetaMask for this to work. Uh, we, the ENS team, operate a DNS and an ENS and IPFS gateway on eth.link. So if you add .link to any eth domain, and that domain has IPFS content, it will load in any browser anywhere in the world, no special integration supported. So as an example, go to almonit.eth.link, and it will load you a directory of decentralized websites that you can access anywhere. Um, you can operate your own gateway. You don't have to trust us to correctly serve up the right DNS records and IPFS con content. You can run this yourself. Uh, and finally, something that we got working just in the lead up to this, we have a DNS over HTTPS gateway. If your browser supports that, you can point it at our servers, and your browser with no plugins, with no special support, will start resolving .eth domains in the browser as if they were top-level domains in the global route. Uh, and we've also been doing some integration with the uh, Tor network. Um, so we had a hackathon project in Eth, Eth New York, a project called STorGate, and building on that, ENS can now point at Onion Hidden Services, which means that you can uh, take an uh, ES, ENS domain pointed at any Onion Hidden Service. For example, Facebook Tor.eth was set up by us, the ENS team, 
And uh, when you go there, it will load the Facebook hidden service. If you load it in a uh, browser that has both Tor and ENS support, such as the Tor browser with MetaMask. Um, and if you look at the records for facebooktor.eth on our manager or on Etherscan, you'll see that they're actually owned by nobody. And what this means is that once it's been set up, it is permanently that way. You don't have to trust that whoever set it up is not going to redirect it to a phishing version of Facebook tomorrow because that uh, resolution is now locked in. It's set in stone. So uh, last up, finally, uh, what are we working on next? So the first and biggest thing that we're working on right now is multi-chain support in ENS. Uh, it's EAP2304 if you want to read the standards document. Um, but what it means is it's a way for encoding addresses for multiple chains, for Bitcoin-based chains, for Ethereum-based chains, for EOS-based chains, for whatever you want in an ENS record. And that means that ENS can become the naming service not just for Ethereum, not just for internet resources, but for every single blockchain out there. Uh, so in supported wallets, if you have a Bitcoin wallet, you'll be able to use myname.eth or myname.com or myname.xyz to load your uh, Bitcoin address or your EOS address or your Litecoin or Dogecoin or whatever suits you. Um, and we really like to thank Binance X for ha giving us a grant that helped us uh, get this past the line. So we wrote the CIP about two weeks ago. Uh, we started sort of talking to wallets and so on. And I'm delighted to say that we already have so much support. Uh, Decent were the first to launch support, so thank you very much. Um, and and I want to I want to specifically call out Brantley, our um, our outreach person, because some of these have arrived just now, uh, like literally minutes before the talk. We now have Coinbase Wallet, uh, Trust Wallet, I Am Token, Haven, My Crypto, Portis, and Opera have all committed to add support for this in their wallets, which is, I think is amazing. Uh, and if you're building tooling and you want to do this yourself, the ENS libraries on JavaScript will support it, uh, but Ethers JS is adding support almost immediately. So if you don't use it already, I suggest taking a look at it. If you do, then you will just be able to use this straight away. Uh, what else are we doing? So uh, as I mentioned, we're rolling out DNS support to most TLDs. Uh, that's effectively every internet top level domain that has DNSSEC enabled, which is about 80 to 90% of them. Uh, we're working on more manager improvements, of course. That's our ongoing work. Uh, we want to make it, for instance, easier to do multiple operations, updates to resolvers, and a simple, single transaction. Uh, we're working on uh, improving the manager interface for short name registration. Again, fewer transactions. And of course, once the auctions are over, you'll be able to register three to six character names just as you can seven plus character names today. Um, adoption, adoption, adoption. It's, it's unsexy in a way, but our main job now is making sure that ENS is as ubiquitous and universal as it possibly can be. And that means making sure that every wallet supports it, every tool chain supports it. It should be the default. You should be able to write a dApp and not even know about ENS, but just have it work because your underlying tool chain already has support for resolving ENS addresses. Uh, so, want to hear more? We have a little more detail. Um, if you'd like to see more about how we're reaching out past just a name resolution on Ethereum, um, then come see Brantley's talk tomorrow. It's 9.35 in the convention room, and we're talking about how ENS is taking Ethereum to the rest of the internet. And that's all I have today for you. Thank you very much.